Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by DigitalOcean, simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it free today. Visit digitalocean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. And by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for the right payments API, check out the Braintree V.0 SDK. With one simple integration, you get every way to pay. To learn more and to try out the sandbox, go to braintreepayments.com slash coding. Today on a wild card episode of Coding 101, we're speaking with David Gatti from NV Drones. Hello and welcome to Coding 101. It's the show where we let you into the wonderful world of the code monkey slash code warrior. I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, and joining me as always is my super duper King Kamehameha, mega mega super special permanent <laughs> co-host, Mr. Lou Maresca. Did, did, that, did that one, that one seemed a little forced, Lou. I don't that know. Was, what about that was that. good. That was a little forced, but that was good. That was, I like that one. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll follow that one back in for perhaps inclusion <laughs> on your lower third. Now, uh, Lou, again, we're here for another wildcard episode of Coding 101. For those of you who, who are maybe skipping episodes here and there, we like to put these interviews in between our maiden programming modules to, to cleanse the palate. It's a chance for you to step away from the coding and speak to the people who are actually doing it for a living. Uh, Lou, we, we've been doing this for a while. In fact, you were on episode one of Coding 101. And this is sort of a nice way to, to segue between languages. Yeah, all, all the, the, the the speakers, all the, the visitors that are coming in the, the next couple of days is uh, the next couple of episodes are actually really exciting. They do some exciting stuff, especially this one is doing some cool stuff. So I'm, this is it's always good to hear from the industry and from people who are really passionate about they what they do because it gets you passionate and it gets you in, interested in, in doing these things. So I think it's really important for us to hear from everyone. Exactly, that's what we want to do. We want to infect you with passion. That's probably not the best slogan, but let's go ahead and get to our <laughs> guest. Last week, we spoke with Peggy Fisher, and one of the things that Peggy told us about was her interest in microcontrollers, specifically in Arduino and Lego Mindstorm. She thought that that combination of computer science and electrical engineering was a very nice place, a, a, a sort of a sweet spot to get to the, the new generation, the millennials, the people who are living with technology today. So our guest for today is Mr. David Gatti. He is the co-founder of NV Drones, a very interesting company that is, is going into that intersection of computer science, of programming, microcontrollers, and, of course, drones. David, thank you very much for coming on to Coding 101. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me uh, on your show. Now, uh, I met you in a very strange way. I, I think you, you sent out a tweet at some point right. that yes. got me interested. I, I looked at your website and I, I, I wrote out to my tweets. I said, this is, this is fascinating. It's a way to easily make an app for your homemade or your store-bought drone. And then yeah. it just blossomed from there. We saw you at Maker exactly. Fair and you showed us what you were actually working on. Yeah, I mean, I knew that you're passionate about drones and you're doing, and you do coding 101. So I you know, was thinking like, well, let's have, do a tweet and see what happens. And turns out that it was a perfect uh, thing to do. Absolutely. So what we're looking at doing is doing a crossover with you because, of course, we want to include you on uh, our other DIY show, Know How. Now, we're going to get into that in a bit. But before right. we start talking about what kind of logic, what kind of coding actually goes into making an app for a drone, we want to talk a little bit about you. Where did you find your passion for creating, for either computer science or electrical engineer? Okay. Okay, this will be an interesting one because I started coding because I was bored at work. <laughs> uh, so literally, like I was a, a IT guy for four years, and I quickly realized that once you set up the infrastructure like the right way, there isn't much to do. Um, so everything was working fine. So starting watching movies, so that was became pretty boring pretty quickly. 
Then I was playing Counter Strike for a few months, and that was boring. And then I realized that well, I can do better, right? So I got a book about PHP, and it started from there. I learned how to do a simple website. Uh, I built a website for my friend. Uh, he wanted to have a blogging platform, and that was uh, during a time where like WordPress was starting to be popular, but not quite. Um, and at that time, it was like very slow and like had you know a lot of issues. And so I did that. And and uh, yeah, and after that, I um, became actually a blogger for four years, uh, writing about mobile technologies uh, while still developing the website that they coded uh, the first time, uh, which was an interesting experience. And when that didn't, didn't work out after those four years, uh, I became a um, web developer at a company and uh, was doing like simple uh, Facebook apps uh, for other companies. And then I transitioned to Android. Uh, so another company had like a Windows Mobile application. I don't know if people know what Windows Mobile is. There was something before the iPhone, um, uh, which was fun. And so I basically like wrote uh, this Windows Mobile app for Android. And that's how I learned how to use, you know, the Android API in Java basically. And uh, from that, what I did. Oh, and then basically that was it when it comes to like um, being a developer developer. Um, I did a lot of like hobby thing, like I learned how to do uh, use Ruby on Rails uh, for a project that I had an idea. Uh, and then I became actually a brand manager, which is weird. <laughs> uh, so, and I started working at a company that was building uh, mobile apps uh, for iOS and Android using Unity. And so I never like wrote a game from scratch using Unity, but I get a custom with uh, what's the whole process. Like, you know, you need an art director, you need assets, you need 3D object, you need texture for it, you need a story, you need like then to code the basic app, then you need to make the animations. Then you need to put all the uh, prettiness uh, on top of what you build, like uh, with shaders, uh, which when I learned what shaders are, like my brain just exploded. It's like, OK, this is too much for me. Um, and so I did. Well, I was a brand manager there. And then at the next company, I became a marketing director, which is also weird. <laughs> and then very quickly I transitioned to being a developer relation manager uh, because at the last company before MV Drones, I was working at a startup that was building like a controller in the shape of a dice or a die, depending if how technical you want to be. And we wanted we were looking for like a developer relation person and we weren't able to find someone that have enough knowledge about marketing PR and it's like open minded and it's like friendly and uh, on ongoing. And so after a while, we decided that, well, it's way easier to find a replacement for me so I can become the developer relation person, right? Uh, because I had the technical skills to like talk with developers, uh, explain the technology, help them out if they need any help. Uh, with coding and using the, the actual product in their games. And so now it's stuck. I like it a lot. I like being a developer relation person because I get to still code, do examples, and basically I like to help people out understand the technology uh, at the company that I'm working at. And so, yeah, that's my interesting story. You know, David, I, I just want you to know that I knew Windows Mobile back when it was still you called did? Windows CE. You know, before oh, nice. you made the jump oh, over. Nice. So oh, nice. uh, because when I talk now with young people, I said, "Oh, there was Windows Mobile." They say, "Wait, what? There was like something Windows Phone?" Yeah, yeah you talking yeah, about Windows Phone? That? <laughs> yeah. So that sometimes is like, and people then I show them screenshots and how it works, and it's like, "Oh my God, this is crazy. This is so old." Uh, you know what? I, so, I had I had an HP Jornada. And it was okay. a very low power laptop running Windows CE. Uh, and I remember oh, it, it had a gotcha. compact flash card slot and a PCM CIA card slot. Nice. And I thought it was it, it was the the, uh, the predecessor to Ultrabooks. It was super light. It was like right. a pound and a half. 
it actually ran for 12 hours on a battery. It, you know, it was interesting. It was yeah, it was I, I love like, I love the idea of that. Like, there was like, I think, sharp libretto, libretto. Yes, yes. Uh, Yes, and that thing was pretty awesome. That was like 85 megahertz. You were able to play uh, Duke Nukem on it, and it had a floppy drive, I think, which was insane. Yeah, uh, <laughs> let me get Lou in here. Lou, one of the funny things about this is uh, Windows CE, when you look at what it could actually do, because you could strip it down so much and then build it up the way you wanted, it's actually... It compares very favorably to today's smart operating systems for mobile devices. It, oh, yeah. It's the basis of a, of a lot of the smart operating systems. In fact, it used to, you would run on like a lot of your ATM machines nowadays run it and um, a lot of the media devices that are on planes, like the older versions of them run on CE. So like when you're watching a TV show uh, on, on the plane, some of the older systems have it. Yeah. So it was a basis of all the, a, lot of the, a lot of the mobile devices. Yeah. David, I want, I want to go back to... Uh, something that you've been talking about is it, it seems to me as if you you kind of fell into programming versus what, yes. what, what we have with a lot of other of, of, of our other guesses they decided early on this is what I want to do they, they took the <laughs> courses in order to get the knowledge they followed a very traditional path in order to get there yours sounded like well this is all self-taught in fact you've got Truno Limit in the chat room who is giving you kudos saying this is the way to go you learn because right. you need to learn, and that's what right. drives you. That's when you learn that you actually have the passion for it. Yeah, the funny thing is, like, I was always, like, a person with a lot of ideas, and I will say, like, I don't want to brag or anything, but normally, like, they were kind of good ideas, I will say. And I always had, like, an issue. Like, I had a friend that he was, like, an awesome developer. Like, he was, like, crazy insane. And... Uh, and so every time I talk with him, hey, let's do something together, it would be fun and whatever, he said, oh, I don't have time, I don't want to do this, uh, maybe later and whatnot, right? <laughs> and so it was also like, I had those ideas, nobody can help me but me, so let's start and learn something. Well, th that, that experience of learning something because you have to, because you have a job in front of you and you have to figure out how to do it, that's right. one thing. But then what happens when you, when, as you said, your, your mind gets blown by something like shaders, where oh, yeah, those suddenly it is so ridiculously complicated and so different from what you've done before yeah. that it, suddenly it, it's no longer really a, a choice just to, to buckle down and figure it out. Yeah. No, like you have to, I mean, the, I not even shaders, also like when you work in 3D space when it comes to game, because doing a game into this like way simpler than doing 3D, and when once I saw the book with notes from a developer that he was doing stuff in 3D, I'm like looking at this book and it's like, dude, this is like an Indian language. I don't know what, what's happening here. And he tried to explain me um, what he's working on. I was like, okay, stop. There's no point. I don't want to know. It's like, enjoy, have fun. <laughs> I have no clue what's happening. So respect for people that do games because it is, I mean, what, when you do like a web page or like even an Arduino sketch or write a typical app, it's just code that crunch numbers to produce different numbers that you can maybe understand or display in a, in a pretty way, right? When you do 3D games, it's, it's just something so crazy and different that, um, yeah, you need to be very good at math, at least. Right, right. Lou, let me throw back to you there on that. Do you see that division? Again, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer th to this a lot. As, as a lead developer, as someone who's actually in charge of projects, do you sometimes get programmers who you say, you know what, I think you've got more of a brain for that division you know, instead of business software? Or you do really well with math, you don't do really well with these logic trees. It, does, does that happen a lot in, in the real programming world? Or do people come as sort of every man? It's tough. Yeah, it does happen. There are people come in and like we're to be doing web apps or something and they're just really good at native development. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be the debugging low level type things and then they'll be forced to do like a JavaScript application. <laughs> and that will be enough sometimes to force people to go to other divisions. But, um, but, but sometimes it does happen where, you know, you just see their skills being so deep in one area and you want them to take advantage of them. So you have, you know, you give them that recommendation. Maybe this is not the best place for you. Maybe you need to go shift to something else. But most people, I mean, especially people on my team, 
I have all levels of, of, of skill and some of them, like I said, will do be able to do low level, but then we'll be willing to kind of jump on the web or and or mobile development type stuff because they want to kind of get on, I wouldn't say bandwagon, but get on to kind of what the new trends are. And so they like to do that to make them more versatile. So it's, it's really dependent on the person too. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, David, let me ask you this. This is this is a question that's been it's getting bounced around the chat room quite a bit. Uh, people are asking you for your favorite language. We normally save that question for the mm. for the end of the episode, <laughs> but uh, I think actually it, it works really well here, especially since you are so self taught. Since since you are so focused on problem yeah. solving, is there a language that you default to, and and why? Mm. I was thinking about this question before because you asked it uh, to think about it and. So I don't default to anything. Like, let's say if I have an idea, I, and I normally will do it like in Xcode for the Mac, uh, just to do, you know, if I need something to do to make it happen like automatically or whatever. I hate Bash, for example. I don't understand Bash. It's like, for me, it's like black magic. I don't know why. Um, but uh, so my favorite language will be like, uh, my initial answer was like PHP for its simplicity. Uh, I will say, and but then thinking more and more, it's I think for me at least it's not more about the language anymore. It's about the frameworks and the APIs that you're using every day, because um, all the language more or less are like similar to each other. Of course, like um, there are like languages like Java that is like more uh, object oriented, and you need to have types, and this is, can be only an int, cannot be a string. If you pass a string, everything breaks. In PHP, you can do basically whatever you want. Um, but the basic concept of, of, of like writing, you have ifs, for, whiles, elf is, uh, uh, if else, and so I would say like it's for me, it's way more important to have like a very Good framework that does the job the right way. So I'm just I want you know the system to give me uh, a pop-up window, right? May, please make it for me that as in a way that is as simple as possible. I don't want to like dig in and understand. Okay, how do I do this pop-up window? How do I put you know cancel button, OK button, and whatever, right? So for me, it's like whatever I, ha I have uh, at hand, and yeah. I don't know if this is an answer or not. I'm not sure. So, David, you, you've had many different jobs in many different areas, even marketing. So, what do you think that these experiences help you build maybe better customer centric or user centric software from that perspective? So, also like the idea that why I stopped being a developer was like a software developer. It was when um, I was working at this uh, company where I uh, wrote from, I, I did a port of the Windows mobile app for Android. And at that time, I was working with a uh, another developer, which was way smarter than me. I learned a lot uh, of, of things, how to develop, how to do it the right way, how to write beautiful code, how to make sure that everything is like nice and perfect. And also, I learned out, you know, how to manage a little bit of memory, especially you know, on Android, when at that time you had only 16 megabytes of space right. for your app, which was pretty fun, <laughs> uh, interesting experience. Uh, especially then we did a lot of like taking photos uh, with the camera. Um, so, and we got to realize that two things. Like, first, he realized, at least for for his side, that. Oh, like you don't have to go to a uh, university. You don't have to be like um, you know have go somewhere to to be a developer, right? You can be self taught, self taught, and still be decent, right? And basically, also the interesting interesting thing is when he had like a problem. To, he had like he wasn't able to solve a problem. I was able to solve it for him because I didn't have this like notion on on how to solve a problem. For me, it was like, well, I don't know that I cannot do it, right? Kind of a thing. Um, and vice versa, when I had an issue, he came to me and said, well, this is pretty trivial because this is how you solve this type of problems, right? Because this is what the university uh, taught him and he was able to do that, right? So it was an interesting like a mix of two types of people. Uh, but the thing that I realized that is for me is like I will never be good as he is because f for sure like he had like this mindset like he was thinking like the machine is thinking 
I was like more creative and I wanted to have a layer of abstraction on top, right? Um, and so that's why I decided, you know what? I prefer to uh, know how to code and I prefer to manage a project and I prefer, um, yeah, to take a big problem, cut it down in small pieces and, and uh, make sure that I give that piece to the right person. And I know like, for example, like this guy's good at whatever, this other guy's good at this thing. And I know how to like motivate them to make uh, something great, right? Um, so, yeah. We're speaking with David Gatti. He is the co-founder of NV Drones. He is a programming journeyman, self-taught guru, really. We'll get back to him. He's, he's gonna tell us a little bit about how he got into creating software for autonomous vehicles. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the first sponsor of this episode of Coding 101. Now, let me ask you, when you finish coding your perfect app, when you finish making your earth-shattering service, the next big thing, what are you gonna do with it? Now, in the old way, we would buy our own servers or we would rent our own space in colos and we would spin up all the software, the operating system, the surrounding support services that we need to get it up and running, to stand it up, to, to maybe sandbox it before we open it up to the public. It took a lot of time and honestly, it took a lot of money. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. We don't live in that world where I need to buy bare iron because instead... I could just go to DigitalOcean. Now, DigitalOcean is the place to go, whether you are an experienced code warrior or just getting started. They give you flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. They provide developers with droplets. These are virtual private servers, and you can customize them so that they can be deployed quickly to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, pretty much anything else that you can think of with full root access. That's right, folks, full root access. You get to decide exactly how your virtual machine, your droplet works. Now, DigitalOcean is built for developers. We use them here at Twit. It's used by over 400,000 of them. And, and for us, we use it to stand up betas. If we want to see how a service is going to handle actual public traffic or if people will probe it for, for weaknesses in its API, you get to deploy and configure your droplets via a streamlined control panel or a simple API that lets you choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, CoreOS, FreeBSD, whatever you want, you can get into your droplet. A one-click install allows you to quickly deploy apps like Django, Docker, Drupal, LAMP, GitLab, MediaWiki, Node.js, WordPress, Ghost, Magneto, OwnCloud, Ruby on Rails, and more. If you need a framework, it's just a click away. They build all their servers with hex core processors, dedicated ECC RAM, and RAID SSD. And all servers can have up to 20 CPUs, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and 640 gigabytes of SSD storage space. In other words, you can start small and then scale it up. Now, that's one of the things I really like. They, they've got this one-click management panel that lets you tell, tell them exactly how many resources you need. So if you can start small, and as your traffic grows, you just grow it without having to worry about the infrastructure behind it. They also give you auto backups and snapshots so that you can clone, deploy, and resize. And they've got full-featured DNS management to help you manage your domains, and they even let you use dedicated IPs. They give you web, web console access with HTML5, plus SSH, SFTP, KVM, VNC for virtual desktops. And it's so easy to get started, you could start an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. Folks, what are you waiting for? DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward processing. No, no surprises when you get your bill. They start at just $5 per month, and they also have hourly pricing available in case you want to go that route. It starts at less than a penny per hour. But we're going to make it so that it's easy for you to get started today. That's right. Just visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, you can go to the billing section and enter the promo code C101 for a free $10 credit. That's right. You could start your first couple of hours, your first server, your first service without paying a dime. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do for you. That's DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code C101 in the billing section for a $10 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Coding 101. We're speaking with David Gatti from NV Drones. He, he explained to us how he fell through one programming challenge to the next, learning as he went until he got where he is today. And today, 
He's with NV Drones. David, what is the philosophy behind NV Drones? Why create this company? So the idea is pretty simple because basically um, we created this company to like bring simple tools for software developers and professionals to create drone, drone solutions, right? And so the vision is like to create simple tools and this is what you're trying to do. Um, and this is our vision and that's, this, is the, this is the stuff that we, every tool that we are going to provide is have this like simplicity in mind, right? Because similarly, um, like in games and 3D space, uh, if you want to build a drone solution, the drone is like flying, it's in 3D space. And that's enough of a challenge in itself um, that you should not like, that, that, that should be like done as in a way that it's like you're sitting down and you're solving actually your problem instead of thinking like, how can I make the drone fly to point A to point B, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And we also wanted to uh, allow people to connect different sensors uh, to the drone so they can take advantage of like, you know, the surrounding of the drone. Now I have here, this is a uh, Alien X 450 class that we showed people how to build on one of our other shows, mm -hmm. Know How. And it's a very basic quadcopter. It's got four motors, four ESCs. It's got a flight controller. This is a, uh, right. a, a NACE 32 controller in here. So you know, it's not super advanced, but it's also pre plenty powerful enough to keep this thing flying. And I can hook up sensors like GPS. It's got a magnetometer. It's got accelerometers. Right. My question would be, why, why would I want to go with something like NV drones and have a specialty board that attaches to my flight controller rather than just getting a better flight controller. Right, so uh, you can fly a drone like uh, manually and have fun and like, you know, take some footage and make a movie and, you know, take photos and whatever. But our idea is to make the drones like fly autonomously. So there is no human involved. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't count the code that the human have to write, of course. And uh, so this is what we do is just for those people that do want that want make the drone do something on its own, right? Because basically the drone is a robot. Right. So you're you're, you're actually allowing people you. to create drones in the truest sense of the term. It, they are autonomous vehicles. So once you yes. set it off on its way, it can accomplish its tasks without any exactly. human interaction. Yeah. And some, you know, the basic example is like what like Amazon is now trying to do, like a delivering a delivery service. Um, of course, they can throw a lot of millions and millions of dollars at the, their project. Uh, with our solution, you can, for example, have a prototype working, I would say, like in two, three weeks. And you have something that actually can, you know, have some servos on board, have a GPS, have um, a sonar and, you know, can pick up something and deliver it somewhere else. And this is what you're seeing here right now is uh, a video that is pretty basic because it's basically an LED like blinking. Uh, too bad we don't have the sound because you will hear that the motor is like spinning uh, on and off uh, because basically we are arming every two seconds uh, the drone uh, uh, with very uh, few lines of code, but basically it's one line of code. And the LED is just to show that we took a sketch from Arduino and we ported it in a way that it works on our platform. Now, let's, uh, if you could go to the Maker Fair video, Zach, uh, let's show them what the actual solution looks like. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a board, it's a development, development kit that uh, can be plugged into any flight controller. I mean, I could pl plug this into a, an incredibly cheap KK 2.1.5 board and yeah. Okay. All the smarts live on this. Yeah, and so you see like the PPWM and PPM that uh, are that these are the ports that you connect the flight controller to. Uh, so if the flight controller support those two type of signals, it's like 90% of the flight controller on the market will work. No problem. And the thing to notice is like once you connect it to the flight controller, basically the drone becomes invisible to you. Uh, so once you write your app, and you want, for example, from a smaller drone, you want to go to a bigger one, you can just disconnect the board, connect it to the second drone, and your app will just work. Because all the sensor and everything is connected to our board. So basically, we are hardware agnostic, 
and we don't care, you know, how big the drone is, what type of flight control you're using. Uh, the only thing to remember is like, of course, you have to like uh, set up the flight controller first and calibrate it. Uh, but once you do that, it's like you can connect anything. Hands off, hands off. And you designed that development kit so that it uses industry standard protocols for communication. So I can take uh, a GPS module that I use with mm -hmm. my, my multi-Wii controller and I can plug it into this. I can take <laughs> signal lights that I'm using with my, uh, with my Arduino powered controller and plug it into right. this. And then yeah. it's, it's just coding. It's, that's all I have to worry about. Yeah. It's, it's, if you can program an Arduino, you can program this dev kit. Yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, so the dev kit, of course, is not done by me. <laughs> I'm not that awesome. Uh, it's done by Jed, our CTO. Um, so yeah, but for example, when it comes to Arduino itself, it's, if you know how to work with Arduino, you can write an app that will draw a drone autonomously. And we are not just supporting Arduino. We are going to support also JavaScript and Java which means uh, with Node, you will be able to write like um, an app running on your Mac or PC. And Java is for those that would like to create a smartphone app uh, using our, uh, Android. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the code looks like in your developer environment. Uh, Zach, if you could go ahead and bring up that first picture. Uh, this is, I believe this is what you would see in a, a regular Arduino sketch. Yes. So this, so this is the... Yeah, right. there is a very important thing right now. Of course, you have the setup uh, setup uh, method that is fired, you know, the only once, uh, and then you have the loop, right? So the loop, if, uh, for those that don't know, it's like a method that is just basically running in loop. Uh, few, you know, I don't know how many times. I don't know. I don't remember the the CPU of um, the Arduino board, but it's like constantly looping, right? And this code was created in a way that is not blocking the loop. Because the example to make the LED flash in Arduino uses this method called delay, which actually like stop the loop for like one second, three seconds, or whatever you, you set it up, right? So uh, if you do that way, when you create a drone, uh, an app for your drone, where well, your drone is basically just you know stop working, right? Because he's not executing code anymore. Um, so that's why there is like this if statement in the loop that checks uh, if enough time was passed, and if it did then you know you can make the, the, the LED flash or not, right? And so this is a very important thing because otherwise the drone, you know, would start doing crazy things. Uh, actually, our, our audience had an experience with this. We did a steampunk Arduino clock with Mark Smith, uh, Smitty Halibut. He's an acquaintance of ours who is in the uh, building space at DEF CON every year. Uh, and uh, he got around this by using, he, he used a, uh, an RTC module, a real-time clock, uh, in order to sync up okay. the software, it, it, but but yeah, this works too. If you know how many cycles it's going to go, that yeah, loop... because at the beginning, like no, no, continue. Please. No, no, no. Go ahead. We were we're going yeah, to say say like at the beginning, like you tell the time, and then you just update the time and make sure that enough time was passed. So you have like the now, which is like uh, the time after uh, the if uh, passed, and then you get the time plus the seconds that you want to check, and. If that matches, then you enter the if statement and you run the code inside. So basically, the loop is constantly running, uh, which is very important. And you will be able to see how important it is in the next slide. Um, if you can show, there you go. Yeah, here we go. So, uh, so the difference here is basically it's the same example, but what we did here, like we added the library at the beginning, the drone age. Uh, this is of course our library. And then we you, we instantiate the drone with doing like drone, and we say the serial port. Uh, if you're using an Arduino Mega, then you can use the serial port one. Uh, or if you're using an Arduino Uno, which have a software serial, then you just uh, do um, you put the two pins that you connected the XB to, right? And then, for example, you have like pin mode, right? The only difference here is like you add like a drone. Uh, dot pin mode and basically this is how you convert your sketch for just Arduino uh, to make it work on our board. You just add the drone object that we just created, right? A few differences here is like at the beginning the setup um, uh, method you have mm -hmm. to initialize the drone and you have to set the uh, flight mode and then in the loop uh, actually in the if statement from before uh, we are just calling like drone.arm, right? And 
and that's it. That's how you arm the drone. There is, mm, you don't have to know like um, how to communicate with the drone or what type of protocol to use and you know what type of commands you have to use in which order and whatnot. Everything is done by our SDK. So you just have this simple super API that you can focus on building your own app. And then when you're ready, you just call the simple API to do something. So in this case, it's like arming, disarming the drone, or you can say like set throttle to 20. And you create, can create a loop that will like set the throttle like every like five steps. So it's, you know, it's from one to 100. No, sorry, from zero to 100. So you go like, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, 25. And so the, the drone can slowly take off, for example, right? And then if you use a sonar, you can detect that the drone is like one meter in the air, so stop going up, right? Um, and yeah, this is how basically you code uh, an app on our platform, platform for your drone. And I think you can think of it like when you see those uh, tiny robots uh, on wheels. Who is up next? Uh, uh, that... Uh, you know, drive, and when they reach the wall, they like change direction because they have a sonar. Basically, you can do the same thing with a drone. And I hope that's exciting. So, David, real quick. So, uh, I don't, I'm not a necessarily 100% familiar with coding, you know, with drones and flight controllers. How is this uh, extra module different oh. than coding directly for the flight controller? Right, so you don't have to know how to code for the flight controller. That's the whole point of like our platform. Uh, right now, if you want to code something uh, for a drone, you can buy a Pixoc, um, which means you can change the firmware on that flight controller. That's why it's, it's more expensive. And uh, you have to write stuff in C, and you have to understand someone else's code because the code is open source. But there's like hundreds of thousands of lines that you have to analyze, understand, and the barrier of entry for like um, basically anybody that's just not experiencing this stuff, it's like almost impossible. And, and that was like one of the, the issues that we had that, uh, for example, the CEO of the company, Americ, and he was building like uh, drone solutions for companies. And he realized that, hey, this is so complicated that there is no point in like reinventing the wheel every time. And that's how we decided to create this thing. And mm -hmm. another thing that is important to know, like, for example, 3D Robotics, which does the, pic, the, the Pixoc, uh, they release an SDK uh, for their platform. And DJI has also an SDK for their platform. But in those cases, like you have only, um, you're like limited to their hardware. You cannot, you cannot use the SDK of DJI on, you know, a drone that you build or uh, a 3D robotic drone uh, and vice versa. So with our platform, you don't, we don't care about the hardware. You can connect the board to a flight controller that is controlling DJI. You can control a 3D robotic drone. You can build your own drone. And you can buy a drone that is built by another company. Who knows? And there's many of those. Um, so once you, uh, as I said before, like once you connect our board to the flight controller, you don't care about anything else. Just you care about using our SDK. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. One yes, of the things it. I really like about your approach is you're letting the flight controller fly the craft. So it keeps yes. it level, it keeps it in yep. the air, it keeps it from falling out of the sky. And you've, what you've done is you've separated the mission computer from the flight computer. The flight computer, all it has sure. to do is just keep it from crashing. And the mission yep. computer actually gives its, its, its instructions. Basically, yeah, basically that's it. And that's why you have to like um, set up the flight controller. Uh, we are not doing it for you. So you have to figure out the flight mode. Um, uh, which you're setting in your flight controller, which can be like a value from zero to 100. Um, so you need to still use the app that they provide for your flight controller and set up everything. And yeah, but once you do that, basically the flight controller just makes the drone stable and not fall from the sky and everything else is done by us. Right. Now, I'm going to tease the audience a little bit here because they've, they've been hearing a lot mm -hmm. of the philosophy of the technology, why you want to do it this way, how it actually yeah. works. But does uh, Zach go ahead and play the autonomous flight video to show what the NV drones development kit actually let them do in real life? Can you explain what we're seeing here right now, David? 
Yeah, so this is basically, this, uh, I, it would be hard to call it an SDK. It was like basically code put together um, to work um, on the flight flight control, wait, I'm lost, uh, um, autopilot, sorry, excuse me. Uh, because we need that, you know, uh, if you want to build an autopilot, the point of the autopilot is like, I want to tell easily like drone fly to this location in a straight line. And the drone will like, rotate and keep like the speed uh, orientation and everything on, on its own right and what we are seeing here is like the drone is going left and right on its own and you we are using the camera on the android phone to read the tag and based on the tag the app knows where the drone is so it can like lock in position and try to make the drone stay in the view uh, of the camera and so in this case, we are like, um, also we were controlling the throttle. Um, so it was like 100% because we didn't need actually that part. Uh, but the point of making the drone go from left to right and, and vice versa um, was very helpful for us to uh, work on the autopilot. And, uh, and that also showed that the um, yet to be a Java SDK, it actually works. We're speaking with David Gatti, the co-founder of Envy Drones. We're going to be right back. We're going to actually ask him what kind of programming expertise, what kind of thought process, logic tree gets put into an autonomous flight model. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode of Coding 101. Now, maybe you make a successful app. Maybe you make a service that many people want to use. Maybe you make the next great big thing. At some point you're going to have to monetize it. That's just how the world works today. We all want to make great things that other people use, but if you don't have any way to support it, well, then it's not going to live. Now, you could cook your own solution. This is what we used to do in the early days of the Internet. You would, you would contact a credit card processor or some sort of payment service. Then you would bodge your way into the API, maybe figure out a way to integrate it with your current service or website without making it look horrible. Uh, you could do all that and then run the risk of your code not being secure, of transactions getting lost, or worst case scenario, someone breaking into your back end and figuring out all the personal information for your customers. Yeah, you could go through that, or you could just use Braintree. Now, Braintree is the best, the easiest way to get payments on your service, your website, that there is. Now, Braintree is code for easy online payments. If you're building a mobile app, if you're building a website, if you're searching for a simple payment solution, you need look no further. The Braintree V.0 SDK, well, they make it easy to offer multiple mobile payment types. You can start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, cards, and more, all with a single integration that's only 10 lines long. That's right, 10 lines, and you get access to everything that Braintree has to offer. A Braintree will give you simple, secure payments, code that you can integrate in minutes. It's secure because they take care of all the security, the tokenized security that doesn't put you or your company at risk. Now, if you're a developer, they got you. They understand that you've had it with APIs that are not well documented. That's not Braintree. You don't have to worry about taking days to integrate your payments because Braintree gives you full documentation. You can have it up and running in minutes with just those 10 lines of code. And if you have trouble, they'll actually have one of their representatives sit with you and guide you through the integration. Now, the Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients. They have SDKs in seven languages from .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby. They have elegant code with clear documentation. And again, I can't stress enough, it's just 10 lines of code. Plus, they offer you a sandbox so you can test out the integration and the security before you go live. It's really a no-brainer. If you want to accept payments on the internet today and you're not using Braintree, well, you're just not using the best. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payments with one integration. They give you quick, knowledgeable developer support if you have any questions. They let you start accepting Apple Pay, PayPal, Bitcoin, Venmo, cards, and whatever is next. Are you out of reasons yet? to not use Braintree, you should be. Use their Braintree V.0 SDK, set it up right now in just a couple of minutes, and be done with it. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash coding. That's braintreepayments.com slash coding. And we thank Braintree for their support of Coding 101. We're speaking with David Gatti, the co-founder of Envy Drones. He just showed us 
a demonstration of autonomous flight, of, of what their, their controller, the development board, will actually do. Now, David, so we understand now how this works. You've got mm -hmm. the flight controller keeping the craft in the air. Yep. It's connected to your development board. You've yes. coded the development board to give instructions to the flight controller based on what it receives from its sensors, the camera at the front or right. the, uh, from the Android phone that's actually looking at the drone. Right. Tell me, what kind of logic goes into here? So how, how did you actually make this work? So we have this notion of a ground station, which means that the ground station can be a Arduino board, can be a PC, or can it can be a smartphone, right? And we are using XB uh, for wireless communication. So you need one XB connected to the ground station and the other XB connected to the uh, tower board, to the, uh, to the, in the extender. And so with an XB 900 megahertz, you get six miles of range in a straight line. And um, the latency is like around two milliseconds, like round trip. And that's why we choose this technology, because it's like uh, you get a lot of range and the connection is very solid. And uh, that's it. That's, that's how you communicate wirelessly uh, with the drone and he can do stuff autonomously. And of course, all the data from the sensor are sent back to the ground station, which is basically your app. So you can take advantage of uh, this data and, you know, create, make the next step for the drone to take. Right? So this is the logic here. You know, one of the amazing things about this emerging field, mm -hmm. and it really is an emerging field, we haven't seen even a fraction of what you're going to start mm -hmm. to see with autonomous vehicles, is they could take a solution like the NV Drones development kit, and they could scale it up. This could as easily be supporting, be controlling a 40-foot-long quadcopter, 40-foot-long multi-rotor craft, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. it is that small 250-class quadcopter. Uh, Correct. It, that's, that's just kind of mind-boggling because the logic stays the same even as you get bigger or smaller. Exactly. So th that's, the, that's the beauty of the system. It's like, yeah, we are truly like hardware agnostic and uh, that's the cool part um, that, yeah, you can make a prototype with a tiny drone and, you know, work it from there. You can, for example, uh, when I was um, testing out a uh, different sonar sensor, uh, I built like a prototype uh, of an app using Arduino and I was just logging the values for the throttle to make the drone stay like one meter in the air, right? And once I was confident that the data is correct and I'm sending the right commands and just, you know, add the drone library, I replace all the Arduino methods with like um, uh, writing at the beginning the name of the object that I just created and basically that's that's you can you can test it out on something that is actually real and small in your office or on, uh, or you know in your backyard and then when you're ready you can just switch to you know your final design and take it from there uh, david we are starting to run out of time so i have to shift into that part of the wildcard episodes where we start to extract your knowledge and give it to our audience oh. because they want to oh. know the secrets of of those people who have succeeded in this wonderful world of programming. One of the questions that was bouncing around from JJ the 4884, he's, he's one of our regular chatters, uh, right. he wanted to know, uh, first, you already told us what languages you like, but also, what resources would you suggest for someone who wants to get into this field? Let's say they're, they're starting off programming, they're not exactly sure where their passions lie, but they kind of like the fact that you're, you've, you're combining software and hardware. What, what, what advice would you want to give to somebody like that? I will start with YouTube. There is a lot of people that are actually very good at uh, teaching others and like conveying ideas. And uh, I, for example, had a friend showing me how to start using Xcode and how to write an app for like the Mac and iOS. Uh, but once I got that basic idea how everything works, uh, I was just, I found like a very good channel on YouTube where the guy was like uh, explaining stuff in a way that I was able to understand and I took it from there. So I, I think like the best way is just to see, because I'm also a visual person, I don't like like tutorials that are written. I need to see uh, what the person is actually doing because uh, most of the time they will like miss something. Uh, they won't like mention something that's for them is obvious, but for you as, you know, as a newbie, uh, it's not. And 
So I would start with videos because then you can, you, you, you're making sure that when you finish a tutorial, everything should work. Uh, because if you do like text-based tutorials, um, then something you might miss something, the person uh, maybe didn't explain something correctly and you're lost and you're frustrated, then you don't, don't want to do it anymore. So I will go with videos. Yeah, good call, good call. Uh, what about people who specifically want to start playing with embedded processors, uh, things like microprocessors, anything from Atmel. In fact, at Maker Faire, where I, I did a, by the way, if mm -hmm. you haven't seen the, uh, the Maker Faire segment that we, we did with NV Drones, uh, go to Know How, I believe it's episode 144, 44, 43. Watch it to see exactly what they're talking about. So you can see the, the it's kind of the spirit of the Maker. But on the other side of the, of the fairgrounds, David, uh, they had the Atmel Pavilion, and they had 12 different partners who were using these microprocessors in different ways. Uh, and it's fascinating because they all come out of the same programming language. They all come out of the same hardware. Uh, if, right. if they wanted to start that, and let's say they wanted to get your dev kit because they, they want to start playing with that, what would they do? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, in our case, like the uh, NVX, have a firmware inside that you don't have access to because that's the whole point. You don't need to know how the board works. You just need to send like API calls and we take it from there. Um, how to start working with microcontrollers and CPUs itself, I would say that's a tough one because actually that's the whole problem is like you have to write everything in C uh, and the level of, I mean, um, so at least like, so we choose, for example, Atmel because it's like uh, easier to start. Okay. But in the previous company that I was working for, um, when we did this like dice shape controller that was using Bluetooth, the electronic engineer there was using actually ST chips, uh, way smaller, way cheaper, but they're basically naked. There is no code inside, there's nothing. Of course, they ST provide something, but if you want to do something very specific, you have to write everything uh, for yourself from scratch. And I must say that's a tough one to start. Um, I will go like start with Arduino, get used to like um, how to stitch together different electronic components together, then start to design your own electronic boards like PCB boards uh, so you can combine all the different separated parts into one part and start to understand how electronic works, what a resistor, what is a transistor, uh, what is a, capacit a capacitor and all those things, and then take it from there. Lou, uh, David spoke about frameworks, how, how he thought frameworks were actually more important even than languages that you choose. An interesting development on your side is that Microsoft is actually releasing a new module for Visual Studio to ease the programming of Arduino devices. That's right. Yeah, they, it's a plugin for Visual Studio that you can actually build. So the sketch code that you write in there is fully compatible with the Arduino IDE uh, and the Atmel Studio. And then it actually lets you su it supports other versions as well, as well as Intel Edison and Galileo platforms. Uh, and it lets you code and debug and, and write examples and do all that stuff right from Visual Studio. So it's actually a really powerful, especially if you're already used to the Visual Studio kind of development environment. So, and there's multiple different ways you can actually do it over USB or Wi-Fi to debug. Um, so it's very similar to be to be able to use Visual the Arduino IDE. But again, you get the kind of the power of Visual Studio. Right, David. Again, thank you for being here. It, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor to have you speak about, again, the intersection of electronic engineering and computer science. Could you please take your time and tell people where they can find NV drones, tell them about your solution, tell them where they can find your work so that they could maybe go out and get their own development kit and, and be ready for when you come back? Yeah, so we have a developer website, uh, which uh, is at developers.nvdrones.com. Uh, we are accepting right now pre-orders uh, for our board. So if you want to be one of the first to receive it, like you can just go right now and uh, pre-order your board. And you can also see a uh, get started guide. Uh, you can check the documentation for Arduino and see um, what type of methods uh, you're going to get from us. And once we are ready and we have something solid, uh, we for sure um, will show you on uh, Coding 101 um, how to make something. Fantastic. That's David Gatti, the co-founder of NV Drones and an all-around journeyman for programming 
and computers. We thank you for being on Coding 101. Thanks, Thanks David. Thank now, you very uh, much, Lou. I'm afraid we've we've reached the end of our episode here. We, of course, want to thank our... Oh, gosh, Lou, you're going to have to help me. What was it? Super Duper King Kamehameha Mega Mega Permanent Kung Co-host. Lu. Kung Fu Hero Co-host, <laughs> Lou Maresca. Uh, Lou, where can people find you when they want to start searching around the nets? Well, you can always find me on Twitter at, uh, at LouMM. And, of course, all my work from uh, Microsoft's at CRM.Dynamics.com. Thank you very much. Uh, folks, don't forget that you could always find all, the, all of our episodes on our show page. Just go to twit.tv slash coding or coding 101. It all goes to the same place. You'll be able to find not just our back episodes so that you could download modules if you want to learn about, say, Ruby on Rails or if you want to learn C Sharp, if you want to learn about PHP. We've got those modules from the past. But you'll also find a little bit of a drop-down menu so you can automatically get Coding 101 downloaded into your device of choice. Audio, video, high-definition video, PC, Mac, iOS, Android, it doesn't matter. We've got a version for you because, well, we love you. Also because we love you, you can find this show mostly live every Monday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Just go to live.twit.tv. And we will have some form of chat room at irc.twit.tv with which you can interact with the hosts as we go along. Finally, don't forget that we can, uh, we can be found on my Twitter page. Just go to twitter.com slash Padre SJ, that's at Padre SJ. When you go there, you'll find future topics for Coding 101, for Know How, for Before You Buy, for This Week in Enterprise Tech, and even for new screensavers. That's right, folks. We want to give you the information you need in order to find out what's going on here at Twit TV. Lastly, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lou, my fantastic co-host, Lisa and Leo, who let me continue doing this show, and to my marvelous TD, Zach. That's right, Eskimo Zach. I don't think he has a camera on himself, but he does have a mic. Zach, could you please tell folks where they can find you if they want to see what else you do? What else I do is on Twitter, and you can follow me there at Eskimo Zach. That's Zach with an H. Thank you, Padre. Thanks for watching. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the Digital Jesuit. This has been Coding 101. End of line. <laughs> <laughs>